Hello and welcome to part two of this class. So I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to be leaving this stuff behind for too long. We're actually going to be revisiting acid-base chemistry in a subsequent unit. But there are a lot of other things when it comes to analytical chemistry and certainly a lot of things that I just find a lot more interesting than that stuff right over there. So let's just get right down to business. Um, here's my buddy Spock here, and uh, I actually want you to focus on what he's holding in his hands. If you haven't ever watched Star Trek, it doesn't matter. I don't watch it much either, but this is some kind of like tricorder machine. It's supposed to be this device that can sense everything, right? It's this future sci-fi thing, but I, I guess it's not actually that future. So this is really what we're going to be talking about, like boxes like this that are supposed to be designed to sense the world around us. So we're actually into topic six now, and topic six is all about instrumental analysis. So here we're going to talk about detectors and just introduce you to the concept of how to calibrate them so we can actually make measurements, specifically the concentration, the quantity of an unknown substance. So picture here a, a mysterious black box, some device whose job it is to sense molecules. You, you can't do anything with a black box, let's fancy it up a little bit. All right, so now we got a machine, a detector, we're going to say, and its goal is to sense molecules. So compounds go into the machine and data comes out. And by the way, the instrument doesn't have to actually physically put compounds into it. This is one sort of variation of how it would be. I'm not going to tell you about how the instrument works. Oh, what's in the box? What's in the box? Okay, I promise we will get to it eventually, just not right now. But as I mentioned, most of these detectors don't necessarily work by consuming molecules. So sample doesn't have to necessarily go into it. Usually we're exploiting the properties of light, or let's call it electromagnetic radiation to be more specific. And what you're looking at here are various types of spectra. They come in all different forms and they all have different names associated with them. And like you see here, just a bunch of abbreviations, which it doesn't really matter what they stand for right now. We'll leave that aside. But the point is that we can exploit electromagnetic radiation to be able to determine compound identities or to determine how much of a substance there is. So as you can see right here, detectors do come with a variety of different sort of complexities to them. pH paper over here is quite simple. I mean, it's just coated with a chemical and it reacts with your substance, acid base, and changes color. That's all it comes down to. A pH meter will work on, you know, a little bit more complexity. And likewise, if you look at an analytical balance, I mean, you can have the electronic balance or you can just have a, a teeter-totter type balance, nice and simple, but they still do the job of weighing. Of course, one might do it better than another. So these are examples of detectors that you might find in the lab. Another good example here is an absorbent spectrometer. So this one here, I actually mentioned it before, sample goes into the cuvette and you take a reading and it's based on Beer's law. So you can figure out the concentration based on the amount of light that's being absorbed. And what you're looking at in these colorful images is based on fluorescence. So the idea that you have like UV light or black light that's exciting molecules and then they're, they're caused to emit in the visible radiation. And you see different colors here being emitted by different kinds of molecules. This is a microscope image. Um, and of course, you know, they're just really colorful. <laughs> so flame tests, another good example here. You get different elements. They produce different lights in the flame. And both by their color and their intensity, you can figure out something about what's actually making its way into the flame. Of course, these are the things that give us these nice colors in the night sky as well. So obviously detectors are available to us in a chemistry lab, but detectors go beyond that as well. I mean, they are available in the home as well. A smoke detector can work on various different principles. In this example here, you basically have like a laser beam and as the smoke crosses the beam, it stops the light from going through and that causes some type of electrical signal. That's just one way of detecting smoke. And it seems detectors are getting increasingly more sophisticated. So what you're looking at here is a smartphone it's the Google Pixel actually, but they've integrated onto the case of the phone these sensors here that basically they, they sense the air around them. So you can tell if the, if the air quality is, is good to breathe or if there's particulates, organic matter that's in the air, and it gives you kind of instant readings from there. On the bottom, what you got here is a blood glucose sensor. So it's basically a patch. 
And rather than having to do like a blood prick kind of experiment, you just pass this over the wave and it kind of gives you an instant reading from there. And I just wanted to show you a couple more examples of kind of the latest in detector technology. I've already showed you a mass spectrometer, but nothing like this one. This is a portable machine. So you've got everything you need to be able to identify unknown compounds. And what you can see here is it's basically sniffing a gas. It's just tiny trace amounts of sample and instantly it pops up, tells you exactly what it is. If you have your sample like on a solid material, say you're swabbing a hand like that, then you can put it in this port here and it basically heats the sample up where those molecules go into that instrument and it tells you exactly what it is. Speaking of mass spectrometry, here's another device. It's called the eye knife. And it was designed to assist surgeons during their surgery. So I know that looks gross. That's actually just a pork chop. But you notice the smoke that's coming off of that? This instrument will sniff that smoke and it's able to sense the molecules from within. And you can tell the difference between normal healthy tissue and cancerous tissue. So it's guiding the surgeons to decide which parts they should biopsy. This news came out just last week, and it had to do with our close neighbor Venus, which is probably one of the most inhospitable places in our solar system. I mean, it's such a hot planet. But what they were doing, they didn't actually go there. They were using these satellites and, and uh, analyzing using spectroscopy to look at the types of, of uh, molecules within the upper atmosphere of Venus. And what they were able to find was quite surprising. So they got a very definitive signal for a compound called phosphine. Now phosphine, if you were to smell it, smells like dead fish and garlic, uh, but what's really unusual about it is that it's produced biologically. So what does this mean? Well, I guess maybe we have some neighbors that we should be saying hello to. And another quick example, so just think of the different ways that you can measure temperature. So these are these sort of resistance-based temperature probes. Uh, but obviously you can do it old-fashioned or you can do it kind of new age, infrared detectors. All right, let's get down to the business of topic six, which discusses how we calibrate these instruments. So I'm just using the example of a thermometer here, but really this example can be general to anything. So let's imagine that we have this thermometer and it's not actually calibrated. So you notice that I don't have any numbers on the scale. So you just get this reading, it reads something. I don't know what it is and you take the thermometer, you put it outside, for example. Now, what is that temperature? Well, from what we have right here, there's absolutely no way to know that. What we need to do is calibrate it. We need to kind of compare this to something else that we do know. What we'll compare it to is what we would call a standard. So since my example is a thermometer, the standard is gonna be something that has a set temperature. So let's just plunge this thermometer into a glass of ice water. And we know that when we have ice water, at least pure water, the temperature should be exactly zero degrees Celsius, right? So I think that means that that temperature right there corresponds to zero degrees. So that's our first standard point. Why don't we take another one? So we'll move the thermometer into boiling water this time. And now that the temperature is rising, it's going to reach an equilibration point, and we can mark that off on the scale and call that 100 degrees. So I guess between these two temperatures and our unknown, we should have all the information that we need. Let's build ourselves a little table here. So I'm gonna use the markings that are on the scale already, but you can kind of think of it as putting a ruler on this and we're gonna be measuring the distance of each of those lines. So the zero degree point, I can count from the first tick mark at the bottom, working my way up, it seems like we have 1.6. There's no units on that, by the way. So the 100 degree point, if I just count that up, it seems to be up to 19, that's right on the line. And then finally, that mystery point, well, it looks like it's at 11. All right, what I'm gonna do now is actually plot this number on an XY scatter plot. So we have temperature as our X, and the scale, or in other words, is the number of tick marks that we have on our Y axis. Okay, so the zero degree C point seems to go right there on this scale, and the 100 degree point will go right over there. And now it looks like I've got two points, which is all the information that I need to be able to draw myself a line. So you could do this in Excel and do a regression analysis from it and come up with an equation for that line. 
And now that I have that line, I can now think of my unknown point and place it onto the curve. So visually, without even using that equation, I can figure it out like this. If I take my 11 uh, on the scale here and just sort of move over till it hits the line and work my way down, I could take the reading from there. And that reading would be like kind of about 54 degrees. I say about because it's going to be hard to estimate that scale. However, if you do have the full equation, then you can think of it as well as just plotting the points within. So the y-axis, that's the number that's coming over here. And we're just now solving for x or solving for the temperature. So you work your way around and you can get, well, basically the same answer that we would do visually. I do find this easier to do mathematically, but this sometimes just helps to see where you're going. So the example that I just showed here refers to a two-point calibration. The goal here is to come up with an equation, a relationship between the temperature and the scale, the markings that we have on our thermometer. And what we worked on here is to create a linear relationship. So we have our, our response value proportional to the slope multiplied by temperature, the x-axis scale, plus the v-intercept, or for those of you who prefer, the y equals mx plus b kind of response. So strictly speaking, when you have an equation of this sort, you do need two points to create the line, so hence a two-point calibration curve. But what if we only had one point? Could we still do it? Well, actually, we can. So if we go back on this exercise here, now let's just say that the only point, the only standard that I worked with was the high temperature point. I still have my unknown that I'm trying to read, but the point at the bottom, I've just eliminated it. Do we have enough information to figure out what our unknown refers to? Well, I'm still gonna call the bottom zero, but not zero degrees Celsius. So just like zero on the scale, and I can measure up to 11, measure up to 19 from there. So when it comes to the one point calibration, this is all the information that we have. And it's actually a simpler process because really all you're doing here is a ratio of the variables. So the, the missing number can get sorted out by just taking a ratio. So cross, multiply, and divide, you can solve for x. And one thing you notice here is that the temperature is not the same value that we got in the previous point. Now, it would have been the same value if our zero degree lied at the zero on the y-axis, but it didn't. So what have we done on the x-y axis? Well, technically, you can't draw a line from a single point. You need two points in space to connect a line through it. But what we've actually done is the point here, the, the value that corresponds to 0 degrees and 1.6, we just made that one disappear. So that point is gone. However, we just select the 0, 0 as our new point. So you see that this point will move down slightly and from there we draw a new line. The B intercept is gone, it's zero, so you don't see it. And then we've drawn our, our new regression line from this single point. So two point calibration and one point calibration actually work out to be the same thing. And of course, you can do multi-point calibration as well, so we can take as many readings as we want on this scale just to get a nice straight line that regresses across the data. So there are a lot of practice problems in topic six relating to this idea. If you're kind of rusty on the algebra, the kind of two point calibration, then that's something that you should touch up on because it's something we're gonna be doing a lot of in this class. And just to kind of remind you here, the idea is that samples go in through these instruments and out comes data. What we're gonna to try to do is manipulate that data to go back and determine the concentration of unknown. To do that, you need to have standards, which is kind of stuff we talked about in the previous segment. So I guess things in this course are starting to come together, which is to say, you're not allowed to forget the things that you've learned before the first midterm. All of that stuff is still relevant. We're just building topics together here. So make sure that you're still working on all of those things, and we'll see you around in the next video.